Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today is that day you've been waiting for, the release of the next Wits End episode. Uh, and, and I know that these, these are the things that really drive you, that help you, encourage you, just to have one more episode from us, especially when I'm talking about myself. Uh, I actually heard from uh, a friend of mine, Pastor Steve Hobbins. He's a pastor on, on the other side of town here in Toledo. And uh, and he said that it was a blessing, and I was I was like, I don't know if it's a blessing. I just it feels weird to talk about myself, and so today, uh, but I do thank Brother Steve for that, and I do thank, um, I do thank the Lord for what He's done in my life. But I'm glad to be moving from interviewee to interviewer today because i am going to get down beneath all of that facade that brother george yeah. puts on <laughs> we're going to go beneath okay it's like they like the underminer he says i am always beneath you but nothing is beneath me <laughs> so that's what we're going to be doing today is that a, is that like a wrestling character what's the underminer well the under <laughs> <laughs> He's on the end of the movie, The Incredibles. Remember that oh, cartoon? Okay. And the I, Underminer. I okay. He comes up out of the ground like with a corkscrew Thanks, drill. I am always beneath you, but nothing is beneath me. <laughs> so that's me. That's me today. I uh and and by the way, uh I it took me a long time before I realized it was not underminding, but undermining. Really? I never, okay. yeah, I never knew that. So, uh, just like I didn't know that pickles were actually cucumbers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so it, it's it's like I say, everything you thought you knew about exposés is wrong. And today, everything that you thought you knew about George Antonio's is going to be put in a whole new light today. So we built it up as much as we can, George. We want to hear your backstory, your origin story. How did you come to get these superpowers that you have? That's what we want to know. Yeah, superpowers. Um, I got saved in Lebanon. My parents were Christians, uh, so they were they were saved. Uh, and uh, born in 82, during the Israeli their, uh, raid there, invasion of Lebanon, uh, they were saved. My mom had led my dad to the Lord. My father, though, was a bit of a something of a, a local war hero for a very particular kind of part of the Lebanese uh, populace, uh, kind of one of the leaders of a right-wing uh, Christian militia. I say Christian, you know, in quotation marks. And uh, so he got saved, and uh, I grew up going to, like, Alliance churches, Baptist churches, but he still was very much attached to his Catholic background. So, like, Easter's, we spent Easter in the Catholic church. I got baptized as a baby. I got my first communion as a Catholic uh, in Lebanon. And, uh, so that's kind of what I grew up in a lot of Bible in, in the, in the churches, but a lot of Catholic background, uh, was fascinated by the saints, the Catholic saints. I thought you had to become, I thought you had to be like an actual Catholic saint to, if you want to go to heaven. Um, I was fascinated by the saints and by crazy people, which I suppose go hand in hand. Um, I don't know. You crazy ever heard people. of Simon? Yeah. Well, you ever heard of Simon, the stylite? Yes. Yeah. So this guy, like for years, presumably in Syria, literally sat on a pillar on top of a pillar, sunshine or rain, people would bring him food, you know, and I thought I had to be like that if I want to get to heaven, you know, like some ladies think they have to become nuns to go to heaven. And I was, it was, I just, I had to find out what makes crazy people crazy and what's going on in there, you know, and a lot of the saints seem to be crazy. And now I know they, some of them. Is really that why work. you're friends with me? Yeah. <laughs> Birds of a feather, right? Hmm. <laughs> Um, so there was that, a lot of Catholic background and then, but no particular conviction of sin. I grew up praying to God. We'd have family altars because it was the civil war in Lebanon. So we grew up praying that the bombs would not fall on our head. Uh, and then one day I, there was for my salvation, there was something like a Halloween. It's on December 4th in Lebanon. This would be 1989 or 1990. And I didn't have a costume. So my aunt lent me her son's, my cousin's costume, cowboy costume. I went to my school. I was the head of the party. I thought it was John Wayne or Charles Bronson, one of those guys, Yule Brenner. Came back. Uh, my aunt shows up a few days later, asks for the costume back. 
and I had hid it under my bed and pretended I didn't know where it was. And I told her I've, I've lost it. And uh, she, of course, didn't believe me. She went like this, you know, pulled down her eye. And I knew she knew I was lying. My mom was standing right next to her in the doorway of my bedroom. So I said, let me look for it. And I closed my door and I pretended to look for it and find it. I found it under the bed and handed it back to her. But I'm telling you, man, Jonathan, the shame I felt. Hmm. And I think that's due to the preaching in the church. Uh, that level, I really felt ashamed. Like, man, I lied to my own aunt in front of my mom. And so that kind of was bothering me. And but some days later, I forget how much we we're having family altar again. But this time I wasn't concerned about the war. I was more concerned with my guilt. And at that night, I understood that it kind of clicked what Jesus had done, that he basically was being punished for my lie on the cross. That's one thing that clicked without anybody telling me anything. So it's not like my parents were leading me to salvation or anything like that. Uh, and the other thing, but of course, I had the background of preaching in Sunday school from the church. And um, the and the other thing was, it's as if the Spirit of God asked me a question while I was praying, which was the following. Who other than Jesus Christ was dying for you on that day on the cross? And to my eight-year-old mind, I was eight at the time, it just dawned on me, like, wait a second, there was only one man on the cross. Only one. So... Therefore, he alone was atoning for my sin. Mary was not on the cross, uh, and the saints were not on the cross. Only Jesus was on the cross, and so therefore only Jesus could atone for my sin. Hmm. And I started, I just, I began weeping. My dad didn't know what was going on. We don't have so much that, at least, I, like, we were like typical Sunday morning Christians and really not an iota above that. We, we'd have family altars because of the war because we were scared. So this whole idea about leading your children to the Lord wasn't really... It wasn't quite the thing, I think, in my parents' minds. They just figured, we'll raise them up in church and it'll happen when it happens. And it did. I'm not saying that's how it should happen, uh, but it did. So he didn't know what was going on with me. He just thought I was crying for whatever reason. So he picked me up, put me in bed, and I slept like a baby. Um, and mm. that's how I got saved. Wow. 30, how old were you? Years ago. Eight years old. Eight, that's right. Eight years wow. old. Hmm. <laughs> that's awesome, man. Yeah. And, and you just, you know... Uh, when a believer hears another believer's story of salvation, when you start talking about who Jesus Christ is and what he's done and how that personal, that's why we call it having uh, a personal savior, um, it resonates with you. You definitely know mm. that uh, that's the same Christ that I met. Amen. And that's exactly right. That It's amazing. And the love that's of Christ exactly right. um, all over the planet for all these years. And it still continues on the beacon. It's the lighthouse. Okay, so you're eight years old, which means you're yeah, probably se I can't eight. seven or eight. I can't quite place it, but it's it's either seven or eight. For well, sure. if it, here's if you don't know what year, then you certainly don't know what day it was. Do you know what day it was? No, I just know it was some days after December fourth, because that's when the oh. costume party was. Well, I don't know. You, 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 I don't know if you ever heard of this. There's a, there's a, a habit, a custom that some places have where they'll sing this song. It was on a Sunday, somebody touched me. They sing it, and then they sing, "It was on a Monday," and they oh, sing yeah. every like that. And people okay. stand up based on the ah. day that they got saved. But, but a lot of people don't know, and so they feel embarrassed. So they have to sing at the end. It was on a someday somebody Amen. touched me so it's kind of funny it, i don't know why it's such a big deal what day you got saved on but um it's but assurance it's, for uh, for a lot of people i wish i knew yeah. the day yeah I that's true I, that's I mean true. i so, so we can get into that maybe another time but like that experience i forgot about for years like in my mind in my mind it's not that oh i have eternal life now right it's just Oh, I'm forgive. I, I feel forgiven. The weight is off, and then I went on mm. with my life. Right, and right. Years later, now I'm in Canada. I'm in the preacher's course, and uh, my pastor, Pastor Larry Theophanopoulos, who who I love like a father, said, "If you're going to be a preacher, you need to have a clear testimony. If you can't tell when you got saved, you have no business telling other people how to get saved." And I sat there. I'm like, I was never asked that. I'm like, wait, I know I'm a Christian, but I don't remember the date. I didn't even remember mm. that story. That story didn't come to mind even. Um, and it's only long story short, it's only when I went back home that night 
that that came back to mind, but I hadn't filed that experience as a salvation experience. Hmm. It wasn't, I don't have like a folder of day I got saved. That folder didn't exist in my mind's archives. So I had to like go back in my mind. I remember that and I'm like, oh, that's what must have been it. And I had to create a kind of a memory for that, uh, the folder. I didn't create the memory, but I created the folder to archive it in there. And that has helped in my witnessing. Uh, but I say this to encourage some certain people who got saved young and may not necessarily remember. And I wasn't trusting like, I wasn't like a Catholic. I wasn't trusting the, I was trusting really the righteousness of Jesus Christ, nothing else. Well, you know, um, I, I, I understand people wanting, you know, a lot of times you hear the dynamic testimonies and the dynamic being the contrast between the wickedness and the righteousness, mm. between the right. darkness and the light. Right. And so that seems like, wow, it was soft and now it's really loud and it was subdued and then it was really bright. And right. and that that's that certainly we thank God for that. And certainly in a, from a spiritual standpoint, from the scriptural standpoint, of course, that's what he did. He re, he translated us sure. from darkness to light. But if you ask someone when did you fall when did you first fall in love what day did you fall in love with your spouse it may or may not mm. be as easy to determine what day that was right unless you fell in love at first sight right which and that's the would, case for some people which would be similar to the you know uh the dynamic testimony correct like i remember very distinctly the contrast correct yeah it's not like i quit cocaine the next day so you know, I got up and went to school the next day, it, you know. Without not... your cowboy outfit. I'm sorry? Without your cowboy outfit. Without the cowboy outfit. Yeah, that's right. Yes. So that, that's how I got to my early you know memory. Why? Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say that that age, that right around that time, there was a resurgence of cowboy stuff for kids. Um, in the States, really? at least I know. Because I remember having a big old desire to be a cowboy. I had chaps i had a holster uh, oh, i'm sorry nice. a, a belt with two holsters two guns i had my hat um so i love it and uh, it's not associated like with sin to me i'm sorry it is in your life but yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh my soul but isn't that so cool how uh, i've heard that multiple times uh of a sin that a child does and is confronted on and how God uses that to show the reality of sin and the judgment mm -hmm. to come. Yeah. One, one lie I was guilty of one. I mean, I'm, I, I would have been guilty of others, but being convicted of one lie was, was enough. And that's, that's the advantage of when you're young, you have a tender heart and being exposed to Sunday school and church, all that created the background that when it was time in my prayer, I knew what had to be done without knowing what had to be done. Hmm. About yeah, the law is our sense. schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Yeah. Man, what yeah. a blessing. Okay, so now you're eight years old. And how long did, how long did you continue in Lebanon? Uh, till, right, till nine, right before nine. It was, uh, I think, that year or the next we left. Uh, it was just right after the end of the Civil War. I want to so, thank the Lord, too. I had a great childhood despite the war. So, it, I mean, it sounds bad, but I had a great childhood. I really did. So, did you have uh, loved ones, friends that... that died in the war no i'm this i mean i could tell you stories about how the lord preserved us it's just an tell us tell incredible. us one well there, there was a day, okay so on one day my sister and i both a school day fell sick i mean like really sick uh and my mom used to work at the united nations and my dad worked so usually in such situations there was a a um, babysitter you get that would come and watch over us well, she got sick that day too, like really sick. So my mom had to not go down to the United Nations in Beirut and stay home and watch us home. That day, that day, fighting broke out. All the kids in the, of the schools in the area got shut up. They, shut, they were shut up in the school, could not go back home. The teachers and the children slept in the school. So you got to imagine the situation. There's, there's no cell phones. This is the 80s, right? No cell phone, no internet, wartime. And you're at school and all of a sudden, this massive school. I was part of a massive school. It's huge. It's like it's got a couple thousand students. And all those students can't go back home. 
and the teachers have to watch them. They're sleeping on the floor in the classrooms. Uh, they want to, they, they have to, you have to feed them. They have to go to the toilet. They're freaking out. They're crying, mass panic. My sister and I, <laughs> we're home, man. We're home. Everybody lived that experience. We spent it with my mom at home. Wow. I mean, this is just, that's the mercy of God. Just the mm. mercy of God. A part of a, an explosion happened in them. Shrapnel went through my dad's car as he's driving and through the front, the windshield. And it just went through the windshield, uh, like a bit to the right of some inches to the right of his face. A few inches to the left, it would have been directly into the face. I mean, that's, mm. that's only, and this is, I, we memorized Psalm 91 without trying. Because my dad would keep on repeating Psalm 91 in Arabic. Hmm. You know, where the Lord is going to deliver you the arrow that flieth by day or, the, you know, the, the pestilence that walketh in noonday or by, that uh, walketh at night. Uh, a thousand shall fall at thy left hand, ten thousands at thy right. It shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou see the, the reward of the wicked, things like that. Uh, he, hmm. Because he has made the, the most high his refuge. You know, the Lord is going to keep you under the shadow of his wings. So just hearing it and hearing it and hearing it and hearing it, we memorized it. And Psalm 91 uh, I can bear witness was a reality in our life, miraculously so. I've, I've got mm -hmm. Jesus Christ to thank for that. Wow. Wow. Praise the Lord for that. I love it. Um, okay, so you're eight eight years old, and what prompted your family to decide to leave Lebanon finally? I mean, you came through the war and probably couldn't leave during that time, I imagine. Correct. So, so my father reasoned because he, because he was involved, he kind of realized i think to his the fact that he had been saved and he had read the bible he realized that the middle east was doomed to an endless cycle of war that any peace that would come to the middle east is always temporary we would never have what like the west has um, and he figured i got kids now and in the future in the event of another war like this i want them to have a way out and so he took us we they submitted to states in canada canada answered first so for him, it was a way of having an Occidental passport that should we come back to Lebanon in the event of another war, we would have a way out. Hmm. I love that word Occidental. I ha uh, You don't hear it very often. Can you explain yeah, that? Yeah, you hear Oriental. Us? West. Just a fancy word. Since you guys say Oriental, we just say Occidental. <laughs> 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 yeah, what? It, who was who was called the Occidental Star? I don't know. It was a king. It was, I think it was a king of England. But really, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, you, so that's very interesting. You said about your dad. Your dad said, um, "We're not going to have peace in the Middle East." Uh, what do you think? Do you have any idea of of the streams that fed into that river? Like what was the, the 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 path of thinking there? His personal. So having read the Bible, uh, now that he was a Christian, he got saved in the seventies and no eighty, I think. And um, his personal experience, he just saw too much. He was very involved since the age of. He started fighting at the age of eighteen, at least. He was like a company leader in, in a right wing paramilitary group at eighteen. Like he was really a rising star. And he really believed in the cause. And he had been disillusioned by seeing the betrayal, even when now he's so, so they're fighting. So to, to give people a little bit of a background, I don't know if you remember those days kind of, but the, what happened was the Palestinians, the PLO, they styled themselves the PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization under the leadership of Arafat had made their ba a base for themselves in Jordan. And they were fighting Israel out of Jordan, Transjordan, which is the Palestinian state, by the way. And then they got so powerful uh, seventy percent of the Jordanians I, that think of themselves as Palestinians, except the Bedouins, and so they became so powerful that they were even like taxing the people and roughing up the people. And the king of Jordan said, "No, no, no, those guys are too powerful." So he, he drove with tanks over them, literally, and kicked them out of his country. And so think about this: so you got you think Israel has problems with the Palestinians? Jordan had problems with the Palestinians and had to kick them out. And so when they kicked them out, they came to Lebanon and made out of Lebanon a base of operations. And so my father was fighting the Palestinian Muslims who had made of Lebanon a base of operations against Israel. Um, Syria had to intervene. And, and of course, Syria wanted to control Lebanon. The United States had to intervene, things like that. So he had seen all that. And he had seen, so he's fighting for his Christian cause because the Lebanese Christians, we think of ourselves as the spearhead of Christianity in the Middle East. 
Now, you know, we're Catholics, we're Orthodox, there's some evangelicals, uh, but they are not much in the balance of political weight. So we th he thinks of himself as I'm one of the leaders of the Christians. We are represent Christianity in the Middle East. We're surrounded by, by Islam. And then to see Catholics and Orthodox betray that cause for money and sell their country for money and send that sell their religion for money and really try to use the war to get ahead and personal gain rather than for the cause itself. It disillusioned him. He said, he basically said, I'm done with this, you know, and uh, I who, want my, who is want giving money. To... Well, it, so, so, well, that's, so there's, there, there's a way to get rich during the war. Of course, uh, if you mm -hmm. like the, the phalangists, the Kata'ib for those Lebanese who are listening, they controlled the port. They made a mint off the port, stole everything that came through the port. Hezbollah does the same thing today. And then, uh, we Israel had come in. This is like more geopolitical kind of history, but Israel had a plan at the time. Ariel Sharon convinced the Prime Minister Menachem Begin of it, and I and I, I mentioned that to Bill Grady, included in his book Holy Ground. The plan was we're 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 fighting pa like so-called Palestinians inside Israel. We're fighting Egypt. We're fighting Syria. We're fighting Lebanon. It's too much. Lebanon's got at the time a Christian majority. So let's. Let's divide up Lebanon into confederation, prop up the Christian majority, train them, arm them. So the Israelis trained Christian militias in Israel. And uh, let's prop them up. Bashir Jmail was the leader of the Christians back then. Ariel Sharon convinced Menachem Begin. He says, we're going to go into Beirut, the only Arab capital ever besieged by Israel. And we're going to install Bashir Jmail as president. And then we'll strengthen the Christians. They'll control the Palestinians and Yasser Arafat from Lebanon. They'll stop them from attacking us like Hezbollah is doing today, only they're Shiites. And then we can have peace on our northern border and focus in on the rest. So the Christians went along with that. Bashir Jmail went along with that. So they come in and circle the Lebanese parliament, set him up as president. Once that's done, it's the Christians are like, here we go. You know, we're working with Israel. We're going to rule the country. We're going to quiet it down. We've got control now. Bashir Jmail gets called by Saudi Arabia. And offers offered an obscene sum of money to betray Israel and renege, renege on his on the deal, so he accepted the money, and uh, started. So he had to Muslims leave the again. country. No, he, who? Uh, the guy who accepted the money. No, no, he didn't leave the country. He just told Israel. He just told the Israelis, "You made me president, but uh, basically, too bad," you know. And he, and he kept on working with the Muslims. And my father and a lot of people saw this for a lot of. My dad was like, he was done with that. He's like, this guy betrays the, the Israelis after everything they've done for, for Christians in Lebanon. Uh, the Christians were willing to sell out for money. And again, when I say Christians, I mean Orthodox and Catholics. Hmm. The Christians, the, those nominal Christians prostitute themselves to foreign powers because Israel is their battlefield. It's their, it's their soccer field. So my dad was disgusted by that. And, um, and ever since, by the way, ever since, that's the reason why the Israelis have never again made an alliance, alliance with the Christians of Lebanon. We broke the brotherly covenant that Hiram had done with David and Solomon. You've, Amos actually prophesies about uh, that kind of pattern of prophecy. And they've never again uh, even considered it. But the betrayal was so deep. Menachem Begin had to be, he's the only Israeli prime minister who was buried without a state funeral because of the debacle, the Lebanese debacle of invading Lebanon and it blowing up in their face. It's only now that there are some, like Amir Sarfati suggesting it, there's some putting it out there that maybe the Christians are finally ready because they see how strong Hezbollah is. Let's redo this plan. Let's arm the Christians, and then they can be a countervailing force to Hezbollah, and we can quiet our northern front. Hmm. Wow. Man, so that all of that stuff is kind of the a recipe for disenchantment and... Um, you know, frustration. And so you guys all embarked to Canada. Mom, dad, you and your sister, Sarah. Correct. Is that correct? Yes, sir. You're nine years old. Okay. You moved yeah. to um, Quebec. Came to Quebec because Lebanese speak French because of the French mandate of 1943. So Quebec was apt to, was more uh, open to receiving Lebanese. What's the French, French mandate? Lebanese. So after World War One, uh, France, the, the Sykes-Picot Accord divided up the Middle East. Um, Lebanon fell under the tutelage of uh, France. <clears throat> and so because of that, we had a lot of French schools in Lebanon. And so a lot of Lebanese grew up speaking French almost as a native language. Quebec wanted French speakers, and that's why Lebanese Christians predominantly uh, got to. But of all sects, 
and religions, they, they were welcoming a lot of Lebanese because we already spoke French and they wanted to increase their French speaking population. Did you go to a French school? Yeah, I did. I did. Uh, first year was very difficult. That's where I learned to pray. Uh, very racist. In Lebanon? No. Yo, yeah, in Lebanon, I went to French. Well, you, you, were, you were taught Arabic and French, yes. Oh, okay. From, okay. Yeah, from like your day, from kindergarten. Yeah. Okay, so then you, you come in, and at what point did you start to learn English? So Arabic first, right? French yeah. second? Mm -hmm. English third? Yes. Wow. Yeah. But I got to say this. I got to put that out there just for my dad's sake. The, one of the reasons why he got disillusioned too is he got caught – um, in the Palestinian ambush on the way uh, on his way up to his hometown and there were a convoy he was with a convoy with the leader of his paramilitary group the political leader and they, they were ambushed and my father was uh, sl sleeping on the ground beside a bridge um, avoiding fire under suppressing fire he couldn't leave and the uh, the guy who was the head of that group George Adouin uh, ditched him got in the car and drove away and left my dad there and finally, my father had to throw himself over a bridge and caught a bullet in the side. And, and they had to operate on him to take it out of his side without anesthesia because there was no electricity in the hospital mm -hmm. during the war. So I just had to get out that I had to put that out there for my dad's sake, why he got so disillusioned. So, but yes, uh, French, more, much, uh, much, Arabic, more French. More philosophical. Yeah. And uh, English, <laughs> I basically picked up of, off of, uh, thanks to you guys, American TV. Oh, really? So what uh, what was your, what was your go to show or one of them? Anything. Uh, Rambo. I remember as watching as a cartoon Rambo. Oh really? Yeah. How about uh, how about GI Joe? Probably yeah, not as much uh, in Canada. No, that was yeah. We had GI GI Joe during the daytime. I remember watching a few episodes of GI Joe. Transformers. I, had, I watched some Transformers. Yeah. Care Bears. Yeah. Watched some Care Bears. I don't know if that was in English though. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man, that, that's <laughs> that's some wild stuff. It's right sick, there. man. How much we're influenced by TV? Oh, it, it really is. It's way it's too amazing. much time in front of that thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out what I've tried to always try to figure out what's the analogy, like what is the 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 connection in scripture, you know? And of course, you have got images in the Bible and that infatuation mm -hmm. with images, but uh, man, I can't even imagine. That tool has been used for so much wickedness. Um, it's crazy. Okay, yeah. so at this point, you're nine years old. You move there, and so do your parents put you in public school? Public school. Worst, that was the hardest year of my life at that point. I'm nine years old. The war was nothing compared to that. Really? I, I had a, yeah, I had a great childhood. Grew up hunting, running in the woods, building forts, building slingshots. It was great. Even the bombings... Uh, look like far fireworks except for one particular scare one once or twice but we had a great childhood and then i came here boy it did not go well south shore of quebec um 1991 so they weren't used to as many immigrants and uh, i was lebanese uh phew, the kids just hated i was the 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 whole concept you've got a concept we don't seem to have that i don't know why uh, in other countries so much but this concept of popularity and reject I don't know what it is with that culture that it's such a big thing. Uh, um, but man, like I, I, I wasn't aware. I wasn't conscious of even the concept of popular kids and reject kids. And I was like the reject of the school. Not not one of the rejects. I was a the reject. Was it a large uh, school? I'm sorry? Was it a large school? Pretty, yeah. Pretty big public school. So, I mean, they had a, they had a song. For me, I still remember the song. The whole class would chant it, you know. Uh, Go back to your country, you dirty Lebanese. I had cousins who were... My cousins are fair, green-eyed, kind of... Um, they're, they're both green-eyed and, and things like that. Maybe they had it a little bit less. They were younger, too, when they immigrated. I was a little bit older, nine years old. The fact that I spoke French better than them backfired. It didn't help. Uh, the parents... Uh, the teachers didn't care too much. I complained to my parents. I complained to the teachers, but there was nothing they could do. Uh, I mean, they would, they would, you know, like this whole idea of like picking people on a team, you, you like two, two leaders stand up and I want to, so they, the, the leaders would fight between themselves because I was the last to be picked and they didn't want me on their team. Like, it's like, literally I was leprous. I had the plague. Um, and all I could do was just go behind, uh, 
the, the school wall and and just cry my heart out and that's when i began to pray that's really when when there was not nowhere to you could only pray who else are you going to talk to mm. you, you know wow um so was that was the first year did that continue into the second year the, I moved, so we moved to a more cosmopolitan area, oh. uh, and that was a lot easier. Still a reject, but compl- a lot easier, a lot easier. I think it, now looking back, it had to do a bit with my personality. It had to do also the fact that I was a Christian. I didn't know it back then. I just had a different spirit, and I had this whole thing about Matthew five. I was telling this to a friend of mine. He's like, oh, "Man, I had the same problem in school in Egypt, around, around Muslims." So like, we grew up like Matthew five, right? Turn the other cheek, and. So, like, I'm a real Christian. I want to please the Lord. And self-defense was perceived of us as sinful. You know, like, you're supposed to, like, let people walk over you. Uh, now, my dad didn't kind of put that into me, but that's how we grew up. Yeah, we didn't really divide the scriptures. The last day of that first school, my father said, I'm going to put you in karate. Uh, but before he put me in karate, he said, look, those guys, when they come to you to, to annoy you, the next time, kick him in the shin. That's what he told me. He's like, just, and he showed me how to do it. He's like, kick him in the shin. And I'm so sure the last day of school that that guy was persecuting me the most shows up with two guys with him. Uh, we're playing and they come up to me to, I don't know, do what like usual. And as soon as he got close, man, I just kicked him in the shin. It wasn't even hard. I had to like overcome my mental reservation. And I'm telling you, Jonathan, I kicked that guy in the shin and he like, he got startled. Like he wasn't expecting it because the whole year he was just having his way with me. And they literally just turned around and walked away. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, I should have done this. And your dad, I done this on your day dad one. became your hero even more. That's right. Like, yeah. And then he put me in karate. Yeah. Well, like you should have uh, told me this. You should have told me this on day one. You know. <laughs> exactly. Were they? Did you get beaten up a lot? Or just no, no, pushed be- around? no, not beaten up. Not beat once. There's no beating up. It was it was more the the, the jeering and the ridicule, uh, writing. Um, they, so they would write like love letters and sign them with my name and give them to girls, um, you know, in the school. Hmm. They would do a destroy property and say it was me, things like that. Uh, hmm. th- throw snowballs. Once later on, one guy uh, took, he put his hand behind my my head and bashed my head into the locker. Uh, it didn't hurt that much. It was just kind of, uh, and I felt ashamed. I was too scared to do anything to, hmm. back to him. Um you know things like that. They would they would find something I I, I wrote and um, stick it on my locker for everybody, all the students passing by to read it. Uh, something mm-hmm. that they thought would embarrass me. Now, um, what what was the primary you know, um, uh, ethnicity in that school? So the first year it was mostly f- uh, French Canadian. French Canadian. Yeah, uh, kids can be cruel, man. But oh yeah, uh, they can be cruel. But I, I mean, I kind of get it too. You know, I kind of get it too. I am different. They, they, I just come from a different country. Uh, you could say the parents should have raised them better, but there's no, there's no gospel background there. So mm-hmm. it's fear that 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 fuels hatred. I think. Yeah, People, fear. Just they're afraid of someone that's different. Yeah, I or, mean, ha- or I, just like, hateful. I'm not. I'm not saying they're any worse than any people. If 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 they had come to Lebanon, they'd experience the same thing. You know. Yeah. Um, so we have to be clear about that a lot. Of, yeah. I mean, have an American go to a to a Muslim school, you know, and, mm-hmm. and or a Canadian, he's going to be persecuted, man. Yeah. He's gonna, my my pastor's son in Greece. The Greek kids tied him to a tree, and made fun of him. They tied him in a tree and walked away. Really. So, you know. So <laughs> it goes always. Oh, that's uh, cool. The other cosmop- the other schools were much more cosmopolitan. There was a lot of Lebanese and everything, but it was just me. Part of it that I'm saved. Part of it is just, uh, I don't know. I just don't have a popular personality, I suppose. Well, w- once when I got back to Lebanon, I was in American school. And I really think it has to do with the Lord because I saw what the popular kids were doing and I got away from the Lord. Uh, and I wanted to be like those guys who had like, success with the girls and everything and i kind of literally watched them and studied them and i said you know what i'm gonna do it i'm gonna be like a bad guy but i'm gonna be like a good bad guy because i know i'm a christian so you know i used to read like Ar- arsene lupin novels like he was like the would gentleman you be like kind of like bat christian in a way 
something like that. Mm. And, and and it, it the problem is that it, it worked marvelously. Like, <laughs> really, I, I was shocked at the success because I, I was gonna be like the the principled godfather, you know. And I'm telling you, I became like the most popular, <laughs> even with the teachers. Like it was it was uncanny. I couldn't believe it. It was like, did you find yourself rubbing your chin a lot? Maybe. I mean, literally, the teachers <laughs> called me the godfather. That was their nickname. <laughs> You know, so I was like, I was like this bad guy, but very principled, you know, because I'm oh, a yes. Christian. Yes. Yes. Studied. Oh, yeah. So that it, 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 so where people really see, were you coming up uh, with decisions, like deciding what we we're going to do with I, this person? I did whatever I, I didn't even have to go to class. Like it was, it was, you know, it did was the great. teachers I, like you? I, they loved me. It there was, I was, I was like, I'm telling you, I was I'd, I'd sit like in their seat in the in their literally I'd sit in their office in their in their seat in their seat. I'm not kidding. They'd walk in, I'm sitting in their seat. But but in here's the, the midst thing, of though. the doctors, yeah, yeah. And so, but so it's an amazing thing. The devil rewards evil. Mm. You know, I mean, I say it, I'm laughing about it, but that was the bitterest year of my life when I look back spiritually. I mean, How I, old I, you? I, I eight, 18. I know. My 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 not my hand in regret at that year because because I was a Christian I was still defending Jesus Christ you know but I wasn't living right then people associated my bad my bad behavior with the name of Christ and my mistakes with the name of Christ so I brought shame on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ I was the most popular so I, I was, I've literally been the biggest reject of a school and the coolest guy in the school and I would every day of the week pick being the biggest reject. I mean, easy decision, easy decision. I regret my 18th year like no other. You know, I mean, thank God it's under the blood. But you really see how this world system is geared towards the Satan rewards evil behavior. So I, you, you see that it's not just personality, it's behavior. It's like if you do righteousness, you're not going to be popular. If you do evil, you will be popular. And that's Bible, right? Mm, man alive. As the young people were say would say, you're spitting facts. Um, I, because isn't it true with with Jesus Christ? Uh, he went out, he went in the wilderness, and then the devil comes along and says, "All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me." And I think the devil's still offering, still offering. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Okay, so you uh, basically kind of a typical life from the time you were nine years old or so forth. Uh, typical Canadian life moving from uh, through through junior high, grade school, junior high. I don't know what you call it. Call it something different up in, up in Canada, I know. Um, but then you get, get to 18, I'm assuming you're about to graduate from high school. Well, so that was a, that high school was back in Lebanon. So what happened was when we came to Canada, uh, Came to Canada in ninety one. My parents divorced divorced in ninety six. They divorced in ninety six. It was a brutal, brutal thing. It wasn't your average divorce. Um, and my dad kind of skipped town. Uh, it was there was criminal proceedings in the divorce in a court case, and so he kind of skipped town and went back to Lebanon. And he said, "I'm done with this." He even went back to his nominal Christianity. He said, "What happened to me was because I left Mary, the Virgin Mary, and because I left the Catholic Church. That's why my." Life ended up a mess and divorce. Now, thank God, he's back walking with the Lord. That took years. So they divorced in 96. For two years, I'm living with my mom. And in 98, Sarah and I, my sister and I, go down for a visit to Lebanon for a visit during the summer to visit my dad. Two years after the divorce. Well, we get off the, and I'm almost 16. She's almost 14. So we get off the airplane for the visit. And at the airport, my father says, you're not going back to Canada. You're staying here with me. Uh, you know, so, I mean, I grew up as a teenager in Canada at that point. I had been there from 9 to 16. So that was um, a shock to our system. We just started crying, couldn't believe it that, that essentially it was, it was, I mean, I don't want to say trap because it's my dad. So, but, you know, he brought us down for a visit and he was going to keep us down there. And I understand he's he's a father and he wants his kids and he misses his kids. So 
So I I'm assuming your mom was not in agreement with this. She didn't. She didn't know anything. She. I mean, she was gracious enough to let us go down because she she knew we had to see our dad. He's in Lebanon now, so she let us go down. Uh, but nobody was expecting that we would be forced to stay. Um, my my sister almost had a nervous breakdown from that. Uh, you know, she's been in Canada since she was younger, a girl. Her mom, she's never going to see her mom again. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I wasn't going to ever see my mom again. So no goodbyes, nothing. You just come off the plane, like you're here. And like there, it's not the West. You can't do anything. If your dad says you're staying, you're staying. That's it. Um, and again, I understand my dad. I understand the, this difficult situation he was in and he misses his kids. So I get it. But my, I was choked up. My sister was going to snap. And so finally I offered him a deal uh, and I said, and it was, it, I said, basically, let, if you let her go back to Canada, I'll stay with you here in Lebanon. And he agreed the deal. And that wasn't just purely out of like selfless kind of self-sacrifice. It was while my dad was away after the divorce, I kind of quit studying. I quit everything. My grades were the disaster. I wasn't even sure I was going to like pass that year. So for, for me, it was kind of also a way to walk away from, my disastrous academic year, uh, not to not to mention the fact that uh, the, the bullying. So I said, I'll just stay here. So he agreed to that. He sent my sister back. Uh, and I stayed in Lebanon uh, from forced to stay from 98. That's when I went to that high school there. And I told you, I, I kind of became kind of a bad guy there at that high school. And uh, from there on, I went to university. Uh, so when I stayed in Lebanon, my father said, you, you stay here, but you cannot go to any evangelical church. You can only go to the Catholic church. I forbid you from going to an evangelical church. It's because I walked away from the Catholic church that these terrible things have, have happened to my life. I should have never, you know, my mom is part Palestinian. So for him, it's like I married one of the women against whose people I fought and I should never have done that mistake. So he was kind of going back to his roots in his mind, right? Mm-hmm. So I figured, pff, whatever, I'll, okay, I'm not happy with that, but I, I'll keep on reading my Bible and praying and I'll be okay. And for two years, I was okay, but the threefold cord is not quickly broken. And the, that's when the third year, when I became what I told you uh, in high school, because I had no, no, no preaching. So I quit reading my Bible, kept, quit praying after two years. There was no church to, to back to help me. I would go to the it's Catholic church, I guess, sometimes, but that was it. Hmm. And uh, no contact with my mom. Couldn't see my mom. Forbade me from having contact with her. So for six years, I didn't contact my mom um, or my sister. And I'm alone in Lebanon with my dad. And that was a very difficult time. For six years? For six years, yeah. 1998 to 2004. So after that disastrous year spiritually, at my 18th year, I repented when I was 19. Got back to my Bible. Um and uh, the verses that, that really got a hold of, of, of me, if I may read the passage, I just want to give glory to, to the word of God because it's really the word of God that, um, that brought me back. Uh, went back to my room, got in my room, picked up my Arabic Bible, and uh, I was reading this here. Can you see the Bible? Yes, I can see it. Those are the verses that grabbed my heart. Jeremiah 31, verse 18. I have surely, God is talking. He says, I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus. And then this is Ephraim. Thou hast chastised me and I was chastised as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. And that was me. You know? Like the young bull is not used to being putting on a yoke. A young teenager is not used to like walking the way of God and being limited. And his prayer is, turn thou me and I shall be turned for thou art the Lord my God. Surely mm. after that, I was turned. I repented. And after that, I was instructed. And then he says, I smote upon my thigh. That's bitter shame. I was ashamed, yet even confounded because I did bear the reproach of my youth. And that's me. And then the Lord steps in again, verse 20. And he asks, is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Meaning like, why do I have an earnest remember of him? He's not even a, he's not even a pleasant child. He's not a dear son. He's, diso he's a disobedient son, but I'm still feeling compassion toward him. He says, therefore, my bowels are troubled for him. 
But when the Lord spake about chastising me, he says his own bowels turned in him. He just couldn't bring himself to do it. And so he decides against it. And he says, I will surely have mercy upon him, says, says the Lord. And when I read that in my Arabic Bible, uh, it was like an, somebody put a knife in my heart and went like that. And all the pus just came pouring out. I must have reread that passage through a veil of tears, literally 10 times over. Uh, I was 19 years old. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm back to reading my Bible. I reestablished contact with my mom secretly uh, through M MSN Messenger, if you remember back in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, so we would chat. My dad didn't know. And uh, she would help me out with Bible verses, encourage me to live for the Lord. I started having a mini revival in my life. I started going to the Catholic church because I was, my dad has forbidden going to the evangelical church. I would bother him. I would wake him up on Sunday morning saying, you're coming with me to the Catholic church. And, um, but, you know, that didn't last too long. And eventually, I'm a university student. And it turned out that the church in which my mom grew up was like hard by my university. But it was a Baptist church. So I finally got the courage to start going secretly to the church. Uh, and I told the pastor there, because they recognized me as being my mom's son. And I told them, please don't tell anybody. I didn't even give them my real name. I, I walked When I walked in the first day, I looked like a terrorist. I had a beard like this, disheveled. Everybody in, in the pews kind of turned and looked at me. They were scared. And then when they found out who I was, they kind of calmed down. And I told the pastor, don't use my real name. I was just terrified that my dad would find out and do something to me and the church. So that's what I was doing for a while. Uh, I met a guy in, at, the, at the American University of Beirut. One day I'm talking to students and we're like a group of guys talking. And there's this American fellow from Colorado. His name is Seth Wilson. And next thing I know, he starts talking to them about the Bible out of the blue, like very bold. He opens up his backpack, takes out his Bible, shows them some verse out of Zechariah that the Lord spoke to him out of. And I'm looking at that guy when he was done. I'm like, are you born again Christian? He says, yeah. I'm like, man, I pre like seeing that boldness, it just set me on fire. So the next day, guess who brought his Bible to the university campus? It was me because of Seth Wilson's example. He's a former Mormon who got saved. Perfect score on his GREs, worked with NASA. He got two eight, perfect 800s on his GREs. The guy's a brain, but loved the Lord with all his heart. He married a Lebanese girl eventually. So I started kind of building up faith. And I knew that I had to, to tell my dad eventually I'm going to Baptist church again. Um, so one day, Wednesday after Wednesday service in the church, man, I tell you, Jonathan, the first day I walked back in church, I had been out of church, out of an evangelical church for five years. The first day I walk back in and I see the pastor walk behind the wooden pulpit and says, open your hymns, you know, open your Bible. Just hearing those words. Mm. just tears streaming down. I was like, I felt like I was home back home, you know, mm. like this is where I'm supposed to be. It was, it was like the prodigal returning, mm. but I had to overcome a lot of fear to go there. So one night I remember clearly I'm making, I was making fun of the man that in Luke nine, the Lord says, come and follow me. And he says, suffer me first to bury my father and I will follow thee." And I was telling my, my pastor after the evening service, I was saying, this guy, can you believe this guy? I'm like, there's guys that told the Lord that we want to follow you in Luke 9. This guy was asked of the Lord specifically to follow him. I mean, he's like, that's equivalent to what he did with the other apostles. And he says, let me first uh, bury my dad. And I'm kind of mocking the guy and saying, come on, your dad's dead, man. Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory is calling you. And you're like, oh, let me take care of this. Who cares? Just follow him. And my pastor says, he says, you know, George, you could read that verse two ways. It could be that his father was dead and he wanted to finish the funeral. Or it could be that his father is alive and he's just saying, wait till I fulfill my duty toward my dad. And once my dad is dead, then I'll give my life to you. And as soon as my pastor said that, I, I didn't know the Holy Ghost throws punches, but he throws punches, man. It was like, <laughs> I don't want to be irreverent, but I felt sucker punched. You know, it was like all the air just, <laughs> it was really, <laughs> thou art the man. It was like the spirit of God saying, you're making fun of that young guy. And that's exactly you. You're afraid of your dad. You don't even tell him you're going to church. You're waiting for something to happen so you can be free and serve God. Because I was under laboring under the weight. My father works for, worked for a very powerful, very influential family in Lebanon. And the idea was they were paying my tuition in university, the Sahnewi family. 
And the idea was that, at least my dad's idea, and it was definitely a real possibility, and they were paying for the tuition because they don't trust much of anybody, but they trusted my dad, was that I would graduate and kind of take over for my dad and then some as the their empire, their financial empire was growing. And they had armed men and things like that, all that kind of stuff. Well, you were the my godfather, father. so there was a, right, there was yeah, a good... Right, yeah, right, yes, yeah. But I, I mean, my dad did all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So my life and his were disconnected. I wasn't even aware of what he was. I mean, I knew what he was part of. But you but had it in thought... your blood. You had it well, in there. I suppose. I, I To me, that was... I, I, it's bizarre. It's like it wasn't my life. It was my dad's thing. Mm. And in my, I think in my mind, it was so sanitized because I respected uh, right. those people. It mm-hmm. was so sanitized. I was like, no, no, no. They're not bad people. Those are like... They're fighting for the cause, you know? So mm-hmm. my father, he's not doing it. I, I can't explain it, uh, but, but yeah. there was a real disconnect between my dad and his men and his world and me. I didn't realize what exactly it was, only mm. with time. So uh, that's what it was. That's I, I realized that was me. So I'm like, Lord, you know what? I'm going to tell my dad. So I went back home. And I told him, I said, Dad, I'm, I'm going to a Baptist church. And on top of that, it turned out it was my mom's Baptist church when she was young. And he <laughs> lost it. He lost it. He took his gun. He got in the car. He went down to the, to the the from the mountain to the beach somewhere. Um, and he started drinking. My dad doesn't drink. He's not a drinker. So, again, there's no GPS, only cell phone. He's not answering his cell phone. I'm telling you, I just got in the car and drove randomly and I found him. Mm. it's just from the mountain i found them by a restaurant on the beach side randomly it's just when the lord does things so he cursed me out he went back home next day was a saturday he said take your bibles get out of my house um which i did what are you what are you gonna do you know i had an apartment in beirut at that time because i was a university student but i would spend my weekends in my in my house back in the mountains and I, just just to make clear my father is a god-fearing man and i thank god for him my dad taught me to fear God. He, he encouraged me to read the Bible. Um, when we were younger, he took us every Sunday to church for 13 years, almost every Sunday. So, you know, he, he, he would pray, man. I've seen my father pray. I've seen his prayer request with the ink smudged by his tears in his Bible. I saw him love God and he taught me to love the Lord. And my mom, of course, very much so. So he was just an embittered, disillusioned man, you know. So I don't want to misrepresent my father. Um, I owe him a lot. And today he's back to walking with the Lord. So I thank God for that. But at the time, he was in a very dark place in his life, spiritually. And that's why he did that. And that didn't last too long. He called me back home afterwards. But from that day, I kind of had some liberty to worship. Now I'm still... Meanwhile, I'm in contact with my mom. And I tell him I want to start visiting her. I want to travel to Canada and visit her. And I'll be back to finish my university. So... I had to fight through that in 2004 to come visit her and my sister. I had to fight through it again in 2005 to come visit her. And then I went back. 2006 was my graduating year. Um, And I graduated in 2006 from Lebanon. Um, And then some more things happened. But uh, that's kind of the the process that we went through there. And he he just got accepted the fact that I was going to church now and I was and. uh, you know, he he tried to stop me, but but he couldn't. Thank God, the Lord encouraged me. My mother encouraged me just to do right, and I explained to him, I want to do right by you. I want to do right by my mom, and my sister. I want to do right by God. Hmm. Wow, painful painful time, no doubt, and a lot of decisions. Um, there's something I've appreciate about you, and I've seen it. It is, um, I would say, a toughness, and I think a lot of of Western culture easily gives up and easily throws in the towel um, and blames other people, the victim mentality, just kind of wilt under the sun. Uh, When the going gets tough, I just call in sick. And um, I don't see that in you. I see uh, tenacity and I see um, an edge, a hardness. And would you say that it's because of these things that you went through that the Lord kind of put that into you over time uh, look, i'm like look, i'm a tender plant my mom my grandma father used to tell my mom you're a tender plant and i'm like her with that 
I am not a strong man by nature. I mean, I, I, I let people walk over, all over me like a doormat in school. Um, it's very much against my nature. I don't like confrontation. I, I, um, it's not me. I know that. But it's really reading the book. It's really what it is. Reading the book and wanting to be like those, those men that I read in my Bible and hearing preaching. Pastor Larry's preaching helped me a lot. He was a man maker too. Uh, the Lord used those hardnesses, those hard things to build me up. I, I can, this I can say from the bottom of my heart, the Lord built me up from the inside out. The strength, mm. I really feel there is an inner strength. And I know, not just like mentally, we're like, yeah, yeah, man, are we God is strong. You know, when you learn by experience, like C.S. Lewis said, you know, uh, uh, he said experience is a, is a painful teacher, but, but you learn, my God, do you learn. And so that kind of strength, the Lord built that. He really did. That is entirely Jesus Christ. Absolutely. I know it. I mean, I know it with a capital K. That's Jesus Christ. Hmm. It's the Bible. That's that's what did that. The Word of God built that in me. Wow. That's a blessing. And uh so 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 at this point you graduate from from the uh, university there in Lebanon, and then what what point did you make your way back here? Yeah, so th a lot of things I have to hold back because, for my own protection, my family's protection, in Lebanon. But so the idea was, <clears throat> now when I was in university, I was in a depression because I had this weight that I'm going to graduate and I'm going to have to serve, walk in my dad's footsteps and that family. And let me say this: that's not necessarily wrong. Some people are called to do that. You know, I think it was the Welsh guy who, the, you know, the grape juice, the heir to the Welsh company. Mm -hmm. he wanted to be a missionary as dad wanted to work for him and the lord spoke to him out of luke i must be about my father's business and he took over his father's business he yielded to that and spent a lot of money from the welsh finances helping churches and missionaries so just to make clear to people listening it's not sometimes you are called to walk in your dad's footsteps but my dad had armed men with him some of those guys were were like leg breakers some of those guys uh i mean when the orders came to do something they had to you know there's no murder i don't, I don't want to don't get any ideas but you know what do you think 100 armed men do right so they're, they're basically the personal militia of a very powerful family and my father was the enforcer that's what it was i can't be that and a preacher because you know i felt the call of god to be a preacher you just can't have I mean, I'm not Ian Paisley where it's not like the Ian Paisley system in Ireland where he has to be protected. This is a little bit different. And those guys had a bad reputation. They were the best amongst the bad guys, but they're still bad guys, you know, the way they, they lived. So till this day, I still hear the comment like from people saying, how can your dad be associated with those people and being a Christian? I still hear that comment. So imagine if that was me. You can't do that. You can't get it. It wasn't going to work. And so every day I would go to sleep and wake up and I've got this albatross hanging on my neck, this, this weight that I don't want to, and they're paying my tuition and they didn't say anything, but it was my, from my father. And I felt this, this expectation that I would graduate. And then as my father served the dad, the dad had a sole heir, his son to that empire. And it was a growing empire. I would be like the, the son's right-hand man enforcer and more because I was educated in university. And my father wasn't. So every day I would go to sleep and wake up with that weight. I had no way out. I was a prisoner in Lebanon. My life was set and I just wanted to serve the Lord and I couldn't. I mean, I was depressed, man. I was depressed. I had no motivation at all. And then my mom told me one day, she said, look, you're supposed to study unto the Lord. If the Lord comes back today, stop. Because basically I was living for the day when I would be free and I will serve the Lord uh, one day. And she said, your studies are serving God. Right now, he expects you to be serving God with your studies. So if the Lord comes back today and you're not putting 100% in your studies, you're going to be judged and rewarded based on that. And when she said that, it just catalyzed me. I got I got, I got, got into my Bible, man. I started studying. I went from having 40s and failing classes in university. They almost fired me. They had a meeting. They almost fired me. And two, two professors stood up and said, keep him, give him a chance. Uh, and when I got right with God, I, I got on the dean's list. So I'm graduating. This is 2006. 
And the plan was we had a contact at Harvard at the Kennedy School of uh, Kennedy School of Government in Harvard. And I would mm-hmm. go there and I would join that school and do my master's in public policy. That was kind of the plan. So I went down to Boston, checked the checked Harvard out after my graduation. And uh, meanwhile, when I was visiting my mom here in Canada, uh, she was in part of Bible Baptist Church with Pastor Larry Theophanopoulos. That's where I got introduced to like Ruckman. So there's all that. Uh, and that was like, that was just, just um, reinvigorated my Christian life. It was the most awesome thing ever. But it, Pastor Larry had begun a preacher's course. And I came back from Boston. I called my dad. I said, uh, I'm not going to Harvard. You know, I'm coming back to Lebanon, but I'm not going to Harvard. Uh, I don't feel the Lord wants me to do that. That's that's not what's in my heart. But I'm coming back. And when he heard that, he freaked. He said, don't bother coming back. And he, uh, for the next eight years, he didn't talk to me. So I got I registered in the preacher's course. And that's how I uh, got on the path of the of the ministry. Were were you accepted into Harvard? No, but I, I didn't need to be accepted. Uh, we had uh, that would have been arranged. Are you saying you know a guy? You know a guy? Yeah. Who knows a guy? The God. Yeah. No, that was continues. that was basically. I was. I mean, it wasn't guaranteed, but it was. It was. It was a shoe in. Uh, yeah. Nice. Nice. Um, that's amazing. So when you got into uh, the preacher course, all right, and what was the promise made to you? And what, what was the uh, the dream? It was, I will be a preacher when I come out? No, it was just past, the pastor I started the preacher's course. Uh, so what had happened on those visits during the summers to Bible Baptist Church in Canada while I was still in Lebanon, some of the guys, that's where the guys in the church there start talking to me about the King James Bible. And uh, I fought them over that for about a year. Uh, my mom started telling me about dispensations and like reconciling James James and Paul. And all those things made a lot of sense to me. And But I still had my reservations. So I would debate with them back and forth over these issues. And some of those guys, you know, Brendan and Mark Onofre uh, introduced me to like Ruckman's books. And I started reading those and man, I OD'd. A lot of people have that experience, right? It was like, what is that? I mean, it was an eye opener. I mean, I mm-hmm. come from like a fundamentalist Catholic Calvinist background. That's that's quite the thing, you know. And to mm-hmm. to, to hit Ruckman is is the quite the shock to the system. So and I was reading that stuff and it was making so much sense. He, the way he believed the book for him. Every word was activated by faith because he believed it as is. And that mm-hmm. faith opened up the door to doctrinal revelation. So mm-hmm. I was kind of in a mood with Dr. Ruckman's writings. And I wanted to go down to PBI since Harvard wasn't going to go work out. My father told me, said, basically, forget about me. You're on your own. Uh, I tried to go to PBI and the Lord closed that door. And today I thank him for that. Mm-hmm. You know, I stayed in my local church with my pastor. And he taught, he was, he had a missionary's heart. He taught a lot about missions. Yeah. He was a great example of walking by faith and he was a tough man. And a lot of our, a lot of us guys in the church, uh, didn't really have a father figure to look up to spiritually in our life. And he was it. Pastor Larry was it. Hmm. So the promise was just stay here. I'll teach you the Bible. I'll teach you how to preach. Uh, take any options you got, any openings you got to preach, pray and see what the Lord does with you. And that's Mm. what I did. Wow. Man, that's awesome. That's really, that's encouraging. And so uh, then, of course, at some point you met your wife. She she was, uh, went to, I believe, an Arabic-speaking Baptist church of some kind? Correct. Yeah. 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 So, on the, so... The main event between those two things and meeting my wife is I, I had a group, seven great years, well, five great years at, at uh, BBC. And then uh, I lived through their typical experience that if you're going to serve the Lord, you're going to be in a church with, I was very, very much hurt in the church. Uh, and, at the, you know, partly at the hands of, the, mainly at the hands of the pastor, uh, the pastor and the pastor's wife lost all my friends almost in the church, um, except one 
or two. Um, you know, called out by name from the pulpit in front of 120 people on a Sunday morning, my mom and I, that kind of stuff. Uh, we were branded as the Pharisees, self-righteous. Uh, it, uh, Sunday, I had nobody to go eat with after after Sunday. I mean, people I eat, ate with all the time. It just become persona non grata. I was like a pariah. I was like reliving being the reject all over again. But now I was in the house of God. So we lived through a patch where it, it, there was no peace in the church, no peace at home, and no peace at work. Um, was, was there really any... Yeah. Was there anything to the charge of being a Pharisee or was no. it a pers matter of perspective? It was a matter of perspective. Now, I've been a Pharisee, definitely. But in that particular case, uh, and, like, and I know because later on there were apologies were forthcoming after after nine months of trial, uh, the apologies were forthcoming and everything fell into place and turned out great. But it's something that you you have to live to. You have to live through. I, I, if I had to, uh, when I heard about that, I thought, I wonder if the devil didn't tempt your pastor with, look at this guy and his mom trying to take over, trying to direct things, trying to usurp authority or whatever the case might be. Um, because just because that's such a common temptation to a leader, look at this person who is trying to rise in the ranks. And I don't know if that's way off. In in this case, I, I mean, th there was a fear of that, but that wasn't for from with me. It was it was more, um, it was pastoral authority creeping into personal space that that we believe was beyond the jurisdiction that God mm. uh, gave a preacher, mm -hmm. um, you know. But like who to marry and things like that, mm. and um, and because we were of a diff differing opinion than the pastor and his wife. Um, we were branded as Pharisees and, and the other, the other side kind of talked about us and we started to keep our mouths shut as much as possible. Um, just because that's, I, you know, you hear the preaching, like, let the Lord defend you, let the Lord defend you. And I was adamant and I'm going to obey the preaching, you know, and it turned out, it turned out well. So, and again, I say this, it, it's not to make, because I, I say this, one of the reasons I say this is because I know a lot of people listening, especially online. You've got a lot of people who are hurt in church. But they're still hungering for spiritual things. So where do they find it? They find it online where there's no chance of being hurt, right? Because you're online. And what you mentioned, the devil at play, I knew deep in my heart from hearing enough preaching that there was a spiritual element to this battle. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about my family. It wasn't about the pastor. But it wasn't about his wife. It wasn't about my friends. That church was a great church. It was doing a great work for the Lord. It was a real lighthouse. And the devil was coming after kind of the pillars of the church trying to shake it. That's hmm. what was going on. So I wanted to always keep in mind that this is not about me. As personal as this, as this is, something bigger than me is going on. Something that has to do with the work of God here. Uh, it was very, very painful. I mean, I, to the point where like I would pray and I feel like the Lord wasn't answering. I, I felt like I was at the edge of an abyss. Like my heaven was brass. I was about to lose my mind because my world didn't make sense anymore. Hmm. The, the church was my home. I gave up Lebanon. I gave up. I gave up what some people give their left hand to have as an inheritance. Lived out of a suitcase. Left Harvard. This is my family now. This is my entire world, and I've lost my family. Like I'm an orphan. I was an orphan for for those nine months. It was it was very very painful, um, and frustrating. Um, and I had to keep in mind that all the preaching I had heard during that time. And one day, you know, we forget just because we were done wrong uh, doesn't mean we have to forget all the good that was done us also. Because one day I remember, and, I, and I've told you this, I think I preached it too at your church. I remember one day after the service, I was just looking at the pastor. He's going around, he's shaking hands. And I was angry, man. I was angry. And he was like a father figure in my life. You know, I was angry. I'm like, man, what a disillusionment. And I'm watching him do that. And I've got anger in my heart. And all of a sudden, it's as if the Spirit of God whispered and said, hey, George, you see that man there? He's doing the best he can. That's what the Lord told me. It was a difficult situation that he was facing. And he's doing the best he can. That's as good as he can do. You know? 
Hmm. It was a difficult situation. There were there were opposing parties, opposing factions, opposing opinions in the church. And as a pastor, as a leader, he's trying to keep this thing together. Now, was it a mistake of judgment? Yes. Even of justice? Yes. But he's flesh. He's not Jesus Christ. And when this, when the Lord said that to me, I can't explain it, man. All of a sudden, that anger, it turned to compassion. I mean, like it went from anger to compassion like that, uh, what the Lord said. And I walked up to him after the service and I said, Pastor, I just want to shake your hand and say, I appreciate you. And he said, I appreciate you, George. You know, and him, him and his wife, both, they loved the Lord. They had sacrificed to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. They had suffered for him over the years. They were old. They were tired. Um, you know, we, mistake of judgment. Who doesn't do those? Who doesn't do this? I, I think Sam Delaney in Tuscaloosa said, and you quoted him once. He said, the Lord sacrifices a lot of sheep in making a pastor. Mm -hmm. The Lord sacrifices a lot of sheep in making a shepherd and building a shepherd. And I couldn't forget all the good that they've done me. And, and they didn't do it out of spite or any kind of evil. They just, I don't think they realized what they were causing in our life. And the mom and I had to humble ourselves more than once, despite the hard preaching. And we tried to handle it like the Lord said. And I'm telling you, and we took it to the Lord in prayer. I'm like, Lord, you take care of this. You see, you open your eyes and you judge betwixt us. And the Lord did. The situation was resolved. The church didn't split. It prospered. My pastor and, and his wife went on back to the States. They're still serving the Lord. He's still like a father to me. I have a great relationship with him and his wife. In fact, I've had them come up back here and preach for us. I'm going to have a moment again. I still call him for advice. Uh, I thank God for him all the time. My friends, the uh, you know, we, we all got over it. And that's why I can talk about it so freely. They are godly people. Again, I say it's easier to for, it's easy to forgive people because I myself have disappointed people and I myself have hurt people. When you see that you yourself are, I mean, part of it, we, we are too quick to brand people as being evil and wicked and wolves and whatever. A lot of times it's, they're weak, like you are weak. I mean, there's plenty of things that I wanted to do right that I was mistaken about and I messed up because I was weak. And when I realized that I hurt other people through my weakness, well, I realized they're doing the same thing. They're hurting me because they're weak. They would like to be better. And that's the best they can do. And so I would have mercy, not sacrifice, right? And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings, the Lord says. So it was easy to forgive because I knew I had been forgiven and I had failed people and I had hurt people and I had failed the Lord and hurt the Lord. Everything ended up fine because I'm telling you, and I'm, I'm avoid going to detail, but I can have one of those YouTube channels where I can get up there and I can tell my story to the world and say, and this is why there's something wrong with the church model. And this is why something's wrong. You know, <laughs> we've got a, something, I don't know what it is, but something's wrong is we got to fix it. And that's why let me be your pastor here online. You know, that, that's kind of where people go with that stuff. And this is why, Everybody's a hypocrite and I don't go to church anymore. I still love God, but. <laughs> You're pretty good, man. That's pretty good. Everybody still gets along. Everybody still loves each other. You got to start it out like this. Yeah. Is there something wrong with the modern church model? Uh, right. <laughs> Classic. That's that's. Yes, there <laughs> is. It's just called because... people. Yeah, that's right. It's what happens with people is because they were the they were the hero. You remember those books, the the adventure where you're the hero. You ever seen? The, I used to read those books all the time. Choose where your you're own like, adventure. Choose your own adventure. That's right. Yeah, in French it was. I read, read in French. Choose your own adventure. It's like because you're the hero of your own story. People, because it happened to them, right? The preaching failed me. The church failed me. I was disillusioned. It didn't work in my life, and so therefore. The whole thing is mistake is broken and I'm going to be the one to fix it. That's how cults are born. That's how heresies are born. Mm. <laughs> you know? Man, that's good, brother. That's good. Um, you know, a verse came to mind the other day that I haven't thought of in a long time. And it is in Ecclesiastes 10. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place 
for yielding pacifieth great offenses. We are in a culture, in Western culture, that says, if the spirit rise up against you, sue him. If the spirit of the leader rises up against thee, That's what happens. you get an alliance together and you out that guy. I mean, you bring him to justice. You can, vigilante justice is perfectly acceptable because who's going to, who's going to ever bring that man to justice? Who is ever going to balance the scales? Who is ever going to right this wrong? If not you, right? Because everybody else is at their beck and call. Everybody else is at their mercy and, and they have crushed so many people and they're going to crush you, but he's not going to crush me because I am going to fix it. But the, the concept of yielding to a spirit, the spirit of a ruler who's risen up against you is, I don't know. Um, in a sense, you think about it's what Christ did on the cross. He yielded to the spirit of God that rose up against him. In fact, his father turned his back on him, forsook him. And uh, what did he do? He yielded to it. He committed himself to him that judgeth righteously rather than um, taking vengeance, rather than being coming back at it. And what happens at the end of it, uh, he, it you know, Ephesians 2 tells us he is our peace. Christ is our peace for yielding pacifieth makes peace great offenses. And that, that's exactly what happened. Mm. That's exactly, you know, what's the use? Uh, Cause one of the things I was, I remember telling a friend later after all this, when we became, you know, I mean, what's the use of hearing all those messages about David and then not, and then not living like David, because we talk about David would not, stretch his hand against the Lord's anointed and his heart's more than when he just cut off a part of Saul's robe, right? His skirt. What's the point? I mean, I remember after one Sunday morning, one of the things that my mom and I were saying when Shimei was, Shimei was cursing David, Nabishai wanted to cut off his head. David said, look, the Lord told him to curse. Let him curse. What, what, am I going to stop him? And that's kind of the attitude. You know, like, Lord, if you're the one who, so you, you're the one who said curse, then okay. Let your let let your curses fall on us. Uh, let the righteous smite me. It shall be kindness. It shall be an excellent oil. which shall not break my head. Now, so you want? I mean, we talk about David, but you got to handle it like David. You know, at the same time, just to be clear, uh, if there's if and nothing like this was happening in my case, but there are some things some things where there's clearly cases of abuse, mental abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse. We're not saying don't you know just say. You know, Amen. Do it all to me. We're not. We're not saying that. Okay. Part of it too is the Lord builds up strength in you where you can stand up and speak up and resist something that's wrong, but still maintain the right attitude. You know. So, mm. I just want to put that out there that we're not saying, you know, the pastor gets to do whatever he wants and you just become a a mat. That's that's not what we're saying. But most of the time, the situations are not at that extreme. And if you handle it like the Lord would have you handle it, it's you got to swallow your pride and you got to die to self. And you really got to trust the Lord that he's going to be your shield. And he's going to be your buckler and that the truth will come to light and give the people the benefit of the doubt. They're, they're not evil. I mean, in my case, they're godly people. Some of the godliest people I've ever met and they're still serving the Lord, you know, still serving the Lord. And I love them dearly and I, and I think of them very highly. Hmm. And we, we well, still and I, all I, get along. And serve the Lord together. It's great. It's great. The, the people need to hear those stories because you only hear the bad stories on the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And honestly, George, you would not, you and I would not be talking right now, and you and I would not be friends if you hadn't done that. You would be, you would be somewhere uh, defending yourself against these crazy ruckmanites and exactly. uh, you know these crazy Bible believers when. Jesus has called us to peace. Jesus has called us to love. And of course he has. But what happens when the righteous smite you? And uh, what's interesting about Jesus Christ is he did not get smitten in his earthly ministry by righteous people, people who are more righteous than him. Um, on the cross, he did in that sense. He became sin for us and his father was more righteous than to behold sin. 
And he said, let him do it. Let him do it. And he allowed that. And then as a result, that that humility enabled you to, to stick in there, hang in there until um, God brought our paths, uh, you know, uh, crossed our paths. And I just, I think it's probably in my mind, it's one of the top three amazing things about your story is that particular story. Maybe it's because of uh, the, the time of life that I'm in and I've seen uh, people get hurt and I've been hurt and the response that you have to getting hurt largely determines what's next in your life. Yeah, let me something I want to say. I've now this is this was years ago. That's all that stuff. I think part of it, whatever humility may have played a part in it, it may have been easier because I was younger. Because I wonder sometimes if I had lived the same situation as a forty-year-old man, uh, and maybe a forty-year-old man would be right in being a little tougher, you know, and standing up because the Lord works on you to to balance you out. I just wonder if, if part of it was not just my weakness that was humility. You know what I'm saying? That it was just sheer weakness. Uh, maybe if I felt like I had more confidence, I would have stood up a little bit more. And maybe I should have stood, uh, stood up a little bit more. Um, but there's a way to do it. There's a way to do it. You got to, you know what Sam Gibb always says? I've heard him say this in a bunch of sermons. He says, don't just be right. Do right. You ever heard him say that? No. Yeah, he says, he says, don't just be right, do right. He says, the most dangerous people in the world are the people who are right. Because in the name of being right, they'll burn, they'll, they'll, they'll burn the camp to the ground, right? Because you've got the zeal and the righteous indignation of being right. That's a tremendous fuel, man. That's nuclear energy right there, right? Mm. He says, if you are on the, on the side of right, then behave right. You can make yourself heard. You can step up. You can say, you can... You don't have to be a yes man. You don't have to be a doormat. You know, but I mean, David stood up and he and he told Saul, he says, you're falsely, you're persecuting me. You know, you're hunting me like a partridge. I've done you, I've done you nothing wrong. And he, he's, he's careful how he frames this. I think he says, he says, people are moving you against me. He's not like directly accusing Saul, you know, he's like, it's not you, O king. Uh, people beside you are moving you against me. He, he he does cut off a piece of his robe. He does steal the the spear and the and the 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 cruise of water right from him. He, mm -hmm. he does do those things. Yeah, he says send somebody to pick him back up. Um, he says the Lord judge between you and me. He tells him that. Mm -hmm. But all the while he's saying my father. He's saying my Lord. He's saying the, you're the Lord's anointed. And when somebody wants to stretch his hand against Saul, he says no, you don't do that. And when Saul dies, he weeps over him. And when somebody comes, even after the death of Saul and wants to desecrate this memory of Saul, he kills them. Hmm. So is David weak? No. But, but look at how he handled it, man. And of course, not, not to make a comparison, I mean, my pastor is nothing like Saul. My pastor is one of the godliest men I have ever met. He's still serving the Lord today in his old age and his wife. So they're, they're godly people. And there's, I'm just, putting those things out there so maybe they can resonate with some of what you guys are living. Um, you know, d d you just have to yeah, do what's I think, right. I think what you're, I think what you're, I think what you're, what you're saying is yes, do what you can do. I think about Joseph when he's in prison and he says to the butler and the baker, you know, I'm not supposed to be here. Right. And, it, and when you get out, you know, do something about it. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm unjustly imprisoned. And I think some, pe some people think, well, it means you can't say anything or do anything. You know, he said, art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. Uh, you know, use it rather. He said, if thou base mayest be made free, use it rather. If you can do something about it and you, you can, uh, and, and I would say, I know he's talking directly about servants there, but in a, in a spiritual or devotional sense, mm -hmm. If you can be more free, um, and, and if you're allowed to be freer and free of this bondage, then great, do that. But if you can't get rid of this bondage and this weight, you can't do anything about the situation you're in, use it. And what did Joseph do in the prison? He used his position to serve other prisoners. And every place right. that he was, he rose to the top. 
And I, I think that our, our culture is such that any little thing that happens that causes me to be hurt is an automatic ace that I have to say mm -hmm. I'm superior than anybody else. I'm better than you because I got hurt. And at the end of it, it doesn't really help you. You don't have peace. No. All if you, you have were in the same situation, strike. you would hurt people even more than the person that hurt you. And see, that I think that right there, that spirit of willingness to be objective and look at it from, if I were there, what would I do? And then a willingness to be, uh, to be honest with that. Because what, if, if you lie to yourself, you'll say, I would never do that. Yeah. If you lie to yourself, you say, I would never treat someone like that. Be careful saying that. One of the best things that happened, this is, this is what I call, I've got a message on spiritual adolescence where, where the adolescent, the teenager has learned some things, right? He's not a child anymore. He has had some victories and now his eyes are opened to the weaknesses of his parents and he doesn't idealize them anymore because he sees, oh, ho, 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 you know, mom and dad aren't so perfect and they were mistaken about this because I learned now some things. Mm -hmm. But what is that? That's spiritual adolescence. You're still not where you are because you, you grow up and you realize, whoa, they messed up here big time. That's not how parents are supposed to do things. And then when you get to 30 and 40 and 50 and you look back, you're like, you know what? Given everything, they did a pretty good job because <laughs> mm. one of the best things that can happen to you, one of the best things that can happen to you is that you need to see yourself doing that which you hate in others. Mm. That'll open up your eyes, man. That happened to me once or twice. That will open up your, you know, the stuff where you look at and you say exactly what you said. I would never do that. Yes, you would. And that's why you're not the one in charge. Because if you were in charge, you would do that and two, two and a half times as bad. Hmm. Two and a half times. There's a there's a book called The Tale of Three Kings. I forget the name of the author. It's like standard Edwards. readings. Right. Standard reading a lot of seminaries. And he basically says, the Lord put David through this so he doesn't become like this when he takes the throne. Because if you had put David on that throne with all that glory and all the honor and the covenant that David had without having been humbled under the hand of Saul before and of his brethren... David would have been a monster, an absolute monster, man. Can you believe it? Like hmm. you've got the biggest, most powerful army in the world. God is fighting for you. You've got a Davidic covenant, especially for you. My goodness. And already look at how he messed up. Hmm. He wow. would have been a monster, a monster. Yes. Considering uh, his, his decisiveness and his passion. He's ready to he kill Nabal and all his household. <laughs> and Abigail has to say, "Cool your jets, mine." <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's, he would, that, heads would have been rolling all over. Oh the kingdom. my god! Yeah, <laughs> the guy's ready to kill. Because I mean, okay, Nabal is a bad guy, right? Just no, I'm not giving you any bread. I'm not giving you any sheep. They was like, "Okay, gird on every man his sword. Nothing is going to remain to Nabal that pisseth against the wall by morning light." <laughs> you could tell by the Lord. Okay, David, you're a king over Hebron. Forget, forget Israel for the next seven and a half years. You know, it's, oh, that's a great point, man. That's a great point. Like a... Oh, that I were made king in Israel. Mm. That spirit, man. I love, I love the Bible. It's so great. It calls you out, man. It calls you out. So I, uh, let's wrap it up here. This is a very interesting story. And um, we we didn't talk. Well, we we're not going to talk about it this time. We got to close. But um, what, what a blessing to think about how the Lord has been calling you. The Lord has been working with you. And since this time of you were eight years old, how many transatlantic crossings have you had? And just you know, cultural differences, ups, downs, back, forth, and how God is, is using you now and has you as a pastor there in Montreal, um, having been around the block and having learned and having a lot of uh, knowledge, but knowledge puffeth up, charity edifieth. And I'm thinking about, you know, some of the things you went through, even with your dad, and I know your story, how you've reconciled with him. And, you know, what is it? Charity thinketh no evil, vaunteth not itself, is not easily provoked. Those are all uh, characteristics of Jesus Christ himself, the Spirit of Christ. And if, if the Spirit of Christ is in you, 
then you have access to those same characteristics, but you have to yield to those things. So when the Spirit of God rises up against you, yield to him. And if you don't, you're going to have no peace. If you don't yield to the Spirit of God as he guides you and teaches you things, as he's taught George, you're not going to have the peace that you want. And it, until until you, but if you yield to the Spirit of God, it's not going to make it all better today. It's not going to make it all better next week or right. probably next year. But what it is going to do, it's going to sow seeds of peace in your heart to to where you can say, Lord, if you ever, to the place where you come out of that battleground and God can put you in, into a large place, and then you have the knowledge, Lord, if I ever have to go back into that place again, I know you can bring me peace in my heart. No matter where I am, I know you can do it. And uh, that's my that's my little devotional wrap-up. Why don't you wrap it up for us today, George? Oh, that's That's pretty much it. That's a good way to wrap it up. I don't really have anything else to add. I I hope that's encouraging uh, to people and uh, the grace of God is the same at work in all of our lives. You, know, you, you read those Bible stories and you just want to be like them. And mm. there's, there's fruit at the end of that. We're still learning. We haven't attained. None of us have. Oh, none yeah, of us good. have. But those were formative experiences. You know, they're formative experiences. Wow. Man, I love it. Well, we could probably, I, I've got a lot more questions for you. I'm glad to not be under the microscope today. I'm glad it was you. Yeah. But uh, that was a blessing, man. Real blessing. So was, we're going to... I owe it all to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's really like a, the Bible, the word of God, the grace of Jesus Christ. That's what we all are, monuments of grace. That book, I can honestly point to that book and say, that's what did it. Mm. The book. I love it, man. And uh, so grateful to to hear that and to to be to be able to talk with you and and um hear what your story is that's awesome if you are listening today and you would like to get in contact with us you can reach us at witsendguys at gmail.com and next time around we're going to jump back into our uh narrative of genesis and uh, we'll answer a question or two but mm -hmm. uh, we're thankful that that uh, you've been with us today and i hope it's been a blessing thank you guys god bless you all